Hi. Happy New Year. Well, it's, I guess it's 5th of January. So, let's get started. This is Advanced Integrated Circuits. It's a course I teach at uh, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in the fourth year. And it's for the people specializing in analog and digital design. First of all, who am I? My name's Karsten Wolf. Born in 1976, which is starting to become almost a significant while ago, <laughs> almost half a century. And during that time, a lot of my life has been spent on electronics. I think I first got my first book on electronics. Yeah, it says here actually. 19, this is 1994. I was living in Australia at that year. Uh, yeah, at that time. And I was looking at these equations and complex numbers and phasers and all those different things. And I didn't really understand any, anything, especially I didn't, didn't understand the math. So I realized I have to learn. <laughs> Now, that turned into pretty much a lifelong learning experience. So I got my master's, I got my PhD on uh, analog to digital converters. I started in Nordic Semiconductor in 2008. And for the first roughly seven years, I worked on analog design. So ADCs, DC-DCs, and a few other sort of small analog designs. Now these analog designs, especially the ADCs, they went into the uh, NRF 51 and NRF 52 and NRF 53 and NRF 91 products from Nordic Semiconductor. Now accumulated sales of these products is in the billions. So I would say it's fair to say that I have some experience with making integrated circuits and analog circuits for integrated circuits. In 2015, uh, an opportunity opened up and I took over the wireless group. So my boss at the time, he moved on to uh, become the head of, IC, uh, head of uh, IC in Norway and I took over the wireless group. And over the wireless group at that time, we did, uh, I still do, all the analog and, well, most of the analog and RF designs for our short range products, for Nordic short range products. So, it seems like I have a cadence about seven years before I need a change. In the wireless group manager role, I got experience with hiring people. I got experience with uh, Bluetooth specs. But after six, seven years, much of my time was spent in meetings and stress levels relatively high, um, and too many years with too high levels of cortisol uh, had an impact on the body, and I realized I needed to change. So I went back to what I love, which is technical. And now I am the IC scientist at uh, Nordic Semiconductor, which basically means I get involved into technical issues that happen before we go into volume production. And it has a wide, wide span from ESD to test. This year, I have with me a student. Let's skip that. Why do I want to teach this course? So my goal is that I, I really want you to learn the skills necessary to make your own ICs. Now, making integrated circuits is not easy and you can't do it alone. So not all of you will actually work on the blocks that you'll uh, learn about in this course. Because what we focus on in this course is mostly analog. Because it turns out the world is analog. The world is govel governed by Maxwell's equations, quantum electrodynamics, and fundamentally is an analog thing. Now, a lot of you will go into digital. And digital is different. Digital is an abstract, uh, invented, idealized world where ones and zeros are perfect. 
and it's more I guess like maths you can actually prove things and you can know things as long as you don't disturb the assumption that there is something called one and a zero and that the one and the zero can be wrong but anyway there's going to be a good mix between analog designers in this group and digital designers in this um, class and that means that some of you will learn about things that you'll never gonna uh, actually design but in my opinion it's still important that you need to know about it because if you actually want to work in integrated circuits all of the components that I'll teach about teach you in this course are necessary for any integrated circuit you can't make an integrated circuit without the components that I teach about teach in this course so the process of making an integrated circuits well we start with the idea you have to have a reason you have to have a goal with making the integrated circuit now that goal may be I don't know temperature sensor let's say you want to make a temperature sensor so that's our idea now some part of that is going to be analog some part is going to be digital and it turns out that in integrated circuits we have automated a lot of the design work for digital so we can actually describe the functions in a hardware description language we can describe what the digital stuff is going to do in something called system Verilog or VHDL well in my opinion don't use anything else than system Verilog and then we can simulate that and these are open source simulators so I Verilog and EPP that's part of the package and you have Verilator which is a bit faster but it is cycle driven so it, it has some limitations you can't do async designs and you have the waveform you recall it, GTK wave all these are downloadable from the internet and are free once you have what's called the re registered transfer level netlist so how what are the what is the behavior of your system then there's a process that has to turn that behavior description into actual gates logic gates NANDs NORs inverters flip-flops and so on and it has to place them out on um, the drawing of the thing that's going to turn into your circuit and it has to make sure that every register and every flip-flop has a clock coming in at the right time and there's enough time between the outputs of a flip-flop to the inputs of the next flip-flops and all propagation through all the combinatorial logic and so on and all that process is actually automated there is a tool called open road uh, which is also open source and freely able available that can turn your registered transfer level uh, system airlock into what's called a GDS2 and GDS2 is the drawing file that we actually send to the foundry and well from that drawing file which has about 40 different layers the foundry can actually make your circuit for analog design it is different we have unfortunately so many options and possibilities in analog design that it has resisted automation over the past 70 years and we basically do it the same as we did 50 years ago we draw a schematic and here says there's a free tool called xcam we use the models that we have the mathematical models on the, of how transistors diodes resistors behave and we can simulate using a uh, it spice is basically a I guess nonlinear differential equation solver so it has a concept of every single node in the design and it knows the currents and conductances and the voltages between all nodes or it tries to know 
and it can compute the time evolution of all the nodes and the voltages and currents and the conductances using numerical methods like uh, newton Raphson or those type of integration methods. So you basically take a step at a time, you try to compute and you try to see if you can compute um, the values of all the nodes and, and the currents and voltages and conductances and so on. Now using those mathematical models, we get a good idea of whether the circuit is going to work or not. The challenge in analog is that you can't just simulate once. You actually have to do it for every single temperature, every single uh, voltage, every single process change, because no transistor that you make is going to be exactly the same. Some of them is going to have a slightly thinner oxide, maybe a slightly more doping, which means that these process variation will create some transistors that are fast and some that are slow. And it turns out that we can't make two identical transistors, so there's also going to be individual small changes between them that we also have to simulate using uh, statistical methods like Monte Carlo simulations, where you randomly assign variation to each of the transistors and you see what happens. <laughs> and you do a bunch of simulations until you think that it's, this is probably going to work, and then you draw the exact same thing again. Because Schematic is very nice for brains. We can easily see how it works just by, well, after a while, after working with it, you can easily see what the circuit is supposed to do. However, it's not at a detail level that can be used for manufacturing. In order to do that, we have to translate the schematic into what's called a layout, which is the physical representation of how the transistor is going to look and how they're spaced and how they're located uh, next to each other, and how the metal is routed between them in multiple different layers and so on. That's also done by hand, and we use a tool called Magic for that. That's open source. Now, <laughs> since we've drawn it twice, we better check... Oh, sorry, I should... If you're English, I should do it this way. Not to give you the bird. Since we've drawn it twice, one schematic and one layout, we have to actually have to check that we drew the same thing. So we run what's called a layout versus schematic to check that the two things are equivalent. And then we can extract parasitics because now we have metal wires connecting our transistors, which means that we can compute the... Yeah, can you give me something to take this off? Sorry, Syrian came in here. Which means that we can compute the resistances and capacitances and, well, in extreme cases, the inductances of the metal wires and we can simulate again. And sometimes when you do that, especially for ADCs, which are heavily dependent on capacitances or RF designs, which are heavily dependent on everything, <laughs> you may have to change the plan and you may have to go back to the schematic and you may have to tweak something, redraw something and so on. But at some point you will have simulated everything you can, you're pretty sure it's gonna work and you also here have a GDS2. Now, quite often, when we do complex system on chips, we will integrate the analog into the digital. Because when you're putting together uh, complex chips, it's really these um, open road type of tools, or uh, from the professional vendors, you have Synop Synopsys IC compiler. Uh, I think uh, Cadence has one that I don't remember the name of. Is it Encounter? Oh, it doesn't matter. It changes all the time. Anyway, there's a tool there to actually do this top-level chip assembly. Now, integrating the analog into the digital means that somehow we have to communicate to the digital engineers how does the analog module work. And that we do via writing a system Verilog. So we code the behavior of our analog system in a digital hardware description language tool. Now, the digital hard digital simulation cannot represent <laughs> perfectly the analog behavior. It's a discrete time simulator. You can't do uh, infinite precision uh, sort of solving of nonlinear differential equations. You'll 
get so lots of errors. So what we have to do with the analog model of uh, analog system Verilog model is that we have to describe sort of a larger abstraction level. For example, for a temperature sensor, it it maybe has just a single output that comes out and then says, okay, when this uh, pin goes high, then you should start counting, and when the pin goes low, you should stop counting. And the count that you get get tells you the temperature, for example. So you sort of abstract away all the analog magic, and you're left with a system that digital engineers can understand and use and integrate. And when you put it all together and you send it to manufacturing and it comes back, it works. Sometimes, not always. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, then you have to go back to design. You maybe, maybe you don't try and tweak everything. Maybe you find that, okay, I just have to move this one transistor that I didn't use. I have to move it from um, this part of the current mirror to the other part of the current mirror. And then, then everything works. So it's an iterative thing. One of the challenges with IC design is as soon as you push the button for tape out, it'll cost you, depending on the technology, from, I guess, 100000 dollars up until a million or maybe 10 million dollars and it'll take you three months to get the chip back before you can measure so it's a very 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 long turnaround and very very expensive now we spend a lot of effort to make sure that what we send to the foundry is going to work but we also spend a lot of effort on measuring and making sure that all the simulations we did actually are correct and we don't have any sort of unknowns because all the simulations are based on mathematical models of reality and it's not really reality it's only when we get the chip back and measure over temperature and corners and so on we can figure that out because what's so incredibly expensive in making integrated circuits is that once i made one okay yes the first one is expensive because you have to make the the mask set or the um, negatives that we use to develop and here if you've used analog film it is similar to how we develop analog film you have your mask you shine a light through and you you sort of expose a um, organic polymer or something like that that changes properties <laughs> when you expose it to ultraviolet light and then you can sort of etch away the things that's been exposed and you can put in metals and you can build up a three-dimensional structure anyway once you have a mask set, you can copy it, and you can copy it very cheaply, down to cents, maybe maybe 10, for the really cheap stuff, maybe 10 cents per chip. Uh, for the bit more expensive part, um, it's still kind of cheap, maybe uh, 50 cents or a dollar per chip. But you make many. So if you make a billion chips, and it takes you two, three years to discover a problem, you may have to recall, or you may have to um, fix a bug. And that's expensive. Uh, Intel did that once. I think it was $500 million or something like that. You can find it on Wikipedia. It's a floating point bug. Anyway, let's proceed. So m it would be really cool if some of you, through this course, learn enough such that you actually tape out an IC. That is possible now. It is possible because there are uh, free shuttles by sponsored by Google, usually. Uh, but there's also quite cheap um, possibilities at uh, Tiny Tape Out to actually tape out a chip. Now, in this course, all the information and all the lecture notes will be at this site. Let me actually minimize my screen a bit. Let's go there. And let's show you here. So I'll put out all the lecture notes. Usually the format will be, if you go into this page, you'll have the slides. So you can open those up. That's the slides I had uh, bef behind here. You'll have this kind of video uh, where I go into details. Most of these videos are from previous years. I may record a new one, I may not, which means that sometimes there may be a 
mismatch between the text and the video. Tough. Deal with it. If you are impatient and you don't like to wait, you can make an assumption that if there's something called AIC or Advanced Integrated Circuits 2024, there is a 2023 one. And indeed there is. And this has all the lectures. And again, it's not necessarily going to be the same lectures. I may change them. Because it turns out that in order to communicate things to you, I pretty much have to relearn every single year. This was a surprise to me. Because I forget between each year. I Right now, at this point in time, we're, we're talking January 2024, and I know somewhere in February I'm going to talk about analog front-end and filters, and maybe January. I know that I don't remember everything in here. So, for example, I think there's some S-domain stuff. This is usually the stuff I don't remember. This kind of thing. I don't remember that. So, today, if I sat down and had to compute the transfer function of this, uh, this is a bike quad, right? This is a GMC-based bike quad. If I had to compute the transfer function of that, I'd spend quite a bit of time relearning things. So, every single year, I have to relearn. And that means that I might not agree with myself from last year on what I want to tell you and what I think is important. So, be aware that if you read uh, last year's lecture notes, this year's lecture notes might be different. I also collected everything into a book from last year, and I'll do the same this year. So this is automatically compiled every time I update the lecture notes. This is built on a, a GitHub action. So, for example, for 2024, if we go back to that, you'll also find the book. And, yeah, and, yeah, so this is compiled every time I update something. So, actually, this was compiled yesterday. There is also a uh, ebook that you can download. Let's not do that now, but you can uh, figure that out. Okay, so this site, Analogicus, Analogicus, that's important to know about. Uh, okay, that's not the window I wanted. I wanted this window. Okay. So, <clears throat> I won't teach you everything that you need to know in order to make integrated circuits. There's simply too much. <laughs> in reality, when you're done with a master's, a five-year master's in integrated circuits, I would say that you have reached a level where it's possible to talk about and actually learn, teach you how to make integrated circuits. You cannot expect that when you finish the master's, you can go it out in the industry and you can teach anybody anything. You still have many years to learn. I don't know if that's the case for all fields within uh, science. I do get the feeling sometimes that in some places the universities are leading and sort of at the forefront. So when you have a master's, you can actually go out and teach people stuff. That's not the case with an integrated circuits. It's a very deep field. Now, in addition to the integrated circuits and what you need to know about the technical stuff, there's also a few things that are really important that I want to highlight. So, how you do, how do you get people to do something? How do you actually get a project flow? I don't want, however, every one of you to become project managers because, in my opinion, a project manager is actually... It's a personality thing. It's not that much a skill. You have to have the right personality. I don't, I think. I'm too uh, easily distracted. But there are tools like Confluence, Jira, 
risk management, failure analysis, there are all tools out there that make running projects easier. You have to know English. You have to be able to communicate in English, both written and speaking. You somehow have to figure out how to handle the stress because I tell you, when you're responsible for, let's say, a few hundred million circuits and you find a bug on those few hundred million circuits and you know it's your fault and you spent the company spent millions and it may go under and it's stressful. So you have to figure out how to, how to handle stress. And I don't have the answers there. Um, I do have a few tricks because I have experienced very well uh, high levels of cortisol and lack, uh, lack of sleep and stomach problems and all those sort of stress effects. So I do have some ideas, but I'm no expert. I don't think anybody is. You have to know Linux. You have to know how to log in with SSH. You have to know version control. Programming is a useful skill. Not everybody has the right brain, though, for programming, in my opinion. And then there's a bunch of other things, like power management. We will talk about that. We'll talk about reset, well, slightly. We'll talk about bias sources. We'll talk about clocks. We will not discuss digital systems, so CPUs, peripherals, memories, bus systems, and those type of things. We will discuss radios, analog to digital converters, comparators, and, uh, well, in some implicit way, you should actually know this already with op amps, amplifiers, current mirrors. These are things that I would expect you to know already. And then we'll use tools, so schematic layout, process extraction, simulation, netlist, and so on. And I do expect you to have some knowledge about physics. But I do also suspect that you don't remember that much. So we'll do a little refresher on that. I program uh, quite a bit in Python. I saw this sort of Zen of Python, and I kind of liked it. So I wanted to make the Zen of IC design. And I, I would recommend you to go into the slides and read those. There is actually quite a lot of um, deep information here. Like, uh, like special cases aren't special enough to break the rules. It's, it's hard at your level of experience, I think, to look at these and actually extract information. But I can look at this. And so to see instances in my professional life where, yes, I have broken the rules in some places and it was not a good idea. So read them and probably forget them, but <laughs> in 10 years you'll remember that, wait a minute, there was something here called the Senovisi design and it's actually a good slide, I think. Beauty matters, especially in schematics. Now, <clears throat> learning. Learning is hard. Teaching is also hard because I have no way to magically make information appear inside your head. It's not possible for me to, to sort of jam information into your head and make it stick, actually make you understand. I think that learning comes th through doing. So, if you actually want to learn analog design or IC design, you have to try, you have to do it. So a big part of the course is actually trying to make something an integrated circuit design. So if you sort of, if I were to sum up my goal for this course, it is really to enable you to learn. So I want you to be able to read the book. Let's see. Ah, this book. This is one of the best books on analog design out there. There's a couple of others. Uh, Rasavi has a good one. I don't know if I have it here. I think I do somewhere. It might be at work. <coughs> 
But Analog Integrated Circuit Design is a really good book, but it's also a very dense book. It's hard to read, it's hard to understand, and it's hard to, to grasp and internalize. But I want to help you. I want you to be able to read papers. So hopefully you know that there's something called IEEE Explorer where you can go and you can read all the papers ever <laughs> within IC Design. So it's about six million items. Now, if you only, if you don't, if you're not planning to read six million items, there's really only one place to go for information, solid state. So if I search for that, hopefully I will find it. Not letters, this one. The IEEE Journal of Solid State Circuits. This is the best journal for integrated circuit design, bar none. So if you're only gonna read one thing, one set of papers, it is the papers in General Solid State. Now, if you know somebody, then you can also type in their name. And to be a bit narcissistic, let's type in my own name and see what pops up. Let's see uh, some of my students and some of my old papers. So for my PhD, ah, this one. I wanna, this is my only publication in Journal of Solid State. That was a lot of work. Who? Yeah. Anyway. So I want you to be able to read those papers <laughs> because just understanding them is hard. And in order to understand them, you have to know the concepts of integrated circuit design. And I want to fix whatever is inside your head and answer any questions you have. Now, as I said, I can't force information into your head. <laughs> you have to actually teach yourself self everything. But if you give me the opportunity to see inside your head by asking questions and really sort of trying, you, you need to try to explain to me how you understand things. Because then I can see where your understanding is wrong. And I can try and fix it to help you uh, understand it correctly. At the same time, you shouldn't expect me to know everything. I don't. I would say I'm not the smart smartest person I've met. I've met smarter people than me. I've met better designers than me. I've met be better lecturers than me. But I do think I have a set of skills <laughs> that is suitable for teaching. I have a very broad understanding. I have a very deep understanding of certain fields. But again, don't expect that I always make things correctly. I am very good at making mistakes, but at the same time, I'm pretty good at finding my own mistakes. Okay, so lectures will be Friday morning if you're not inside NTNU, well, tough luck, you won't be there. And then from 10 to 12, we'll do the project. And here we are going to meet, the groups are going to meet, and you're going to work on the project. You can find all the information on this time schedule. I kind of want to touch on two things. So we, I've, I've put in the syllabus. So this is from the book, and in, addi in addition to the book, I've added a few papers that I expect you to read. So by the time we get towards, I guess, around May, the syllabus will be locked down. S now still, it is, has, it is possible that it's going to change. I don't think it's going to change. And then we have the lecture plan. So, yeah, intro, that's now. ICs and their components and so on, reference and bias, filters and DAX, 
actually on DAX, I'm going to get uh, the teaching assistant, Jonathan, to help me out. Switch capacitor, oversampling converters, then winter holiday, voltage regulation, PLLs, oscillators, low power radio receivers. We're going to have Easter. And that's a bit to allow you to work on the project also. <clears throat> and then analog system Verilog. And then a bunch of QAs until we get to the exam. There are YouTube videos from previous years and so on. I spoke about that. The exam is going to be in June. It's four hours. Um, it counts for 55% of the grade. There are problem sets, exercises, but you're adults. I'm not going to do a lot of obligatory things or compulsory things. There is one, though, that I do you have to hand in, and that is the first one. It's the tutorial on the Skywater. And I want to force you, make sure I force you early enough to go through an analog design, so schematic, layout, simulation, and so on, such that you understand <laughs> how much work it is uh, to do the project. So that you don't wait until February or whatever and you start working on a project and you go, wow, this is going to be a lot. Because it is going to be a lot. I'm, I, I am going to ask a lot of you. So the project counts for 45% of the grade. There's no point in going to the exam if you don't have it in the project. Then you have to retake the course. And it is a very strict deadline. You have to hand it in by the 29th of April. Other than that, you're... yeah. So I, I'm a big fan of science fiction. I'm also a big fan of strong women in science fiction. So I've picked up the quotes and the prefixes or uh, names from um, for the project from science fiction. So this year it's Connor, Sarah Connor from Terminator. Last year, it was Eden Sun from Farscape, and I believe before there, it was uh, Ellen Ripley from um, Alien. Pajurgo is the design and integrated temperature sensor with a digital readout. I use this assignment because it's one of the few things where, where you don't need an analog input. The temperature is just there in the silicon, so you can just read it. Now, this is a daunting task. I've seen in the years before that some people have become demotivated because it's become it's so complex, it's so large, it, it's so difficult task. So this year I'm going to do it slightly differently. I'm going to break it up for you. So we have five milestones. We have milestone one, milestone two, milestone three, milestone four, and milestone milestone five. The first milestone. We're just going to focus on the first part. How do we get a current that is a function of temperature? Once we've figured out that, we'll proceed to the next thing. How do we get a time that is a function of current? And then, proceeding from that, how do we get a digital value that is a function of time? And then we're also going to need a clock. In the end, we're going to end up with a two's complement representation of the temperature or something that can be manipulated to represent temperature. And then we're going to do layout and, in the end, report. Now, I'm also going to try and force you to work in sort of a collaborative manner. So you'll be, select, you'll be divided into groups. There will be maximum four people per group. There is a maximum of three people that know each other from before. That's at least <laughs> the rules I plan to use. And then I actually want us to focus on how we work in groups. It's quite amazing what can happen if you work together with bright brains and actually uh, cooperate. It's kind of magical. A, sort of the feeling of playing off other smart brains and really seeing how the collective brain is much, much smarter and better than any single person. So if it's if you get, get to that state, that's fantastic. But in order to get to that state, we're going to structure how we work in groups a bit. So 
since you're in groups where most of you don't know each other, then we also always going to start with, with what's called a check-in. That's just a couple of questions. I'll give it to them, give you to them later. Give you to them. Give them to you later. But it's kind of like, how are you feeling today? Oh. So maybe, uh, today I have an omelet in the morning and I went for a run and I feel fantastic. Another day it's, oh, why my dog died yesterday, so I'm feeling crap. So that type of thing. It may sound silly and it may sound counterproductive, but it is actually something that has been proven to create psychological safety. And then we're, we're going to work on the ideas. So that's sort of the initial meeting in a milestone, the ideas for how we're going to create a current that is a function of temperature. And we're going to make a plan. And then we're going to talk about, and we're going to actually, we're going to reflect first. We're going to think about how was the group dynamics today? What worked well? What should we stop doing? What should we continue to do? What should we make better? And then we discuss that, that and then you discuss that at the end. So I'm 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 structuring your group work and hopefully that'll make it easier and better. And then we'll also discuss the ideas in plenum uh, in um, with everybody. But I, this actually requires that you're there. You have to be there. You should be there 10 to 12 on Fridays. And grading. Okay. So let's see. I'm using a confluence page. You won't have access to this yet. Um, once I give you access, you'll have access, which means that everybody watching this on YouTube that is not a student at NTNU, you won't see, be able to see this page. Anyway, so the grading is for first milestone. When we get to the end, that you have a circuit block that can convert temperature into a current. And you've simulated that it kind of works. That gives you 10 points. So that means every single milestone here gives you a certain amount of points. Now, if you sum these up, you actually get to more than 100 points. And there's a reason for that. Some of you will not be able to get to layout. And maybe not even to, well, hopefully everybody gets to digital. I think everybody, from experience, I believe that everybody will get to digital but I don't think everybody will get to a finished layout. And you don't have to. You decide. So don't miss out on the early milestones. Those give you points. The later milestones will bring you, let's see. So uh, it should go to 108. Is that the max? I don't remember. You figured that, figured that out. But uh, designed it such that it's not possible to get an A without uh, doing the layout. But at the same time, it is possible to get a B with ignoring the layout. So here it depends on your, uh, yeah, level of effort. And, but it, it is hard to get an A on the project, just to tell you that. But you can get then a B on the project and an A on the exam, and that would actually get you an A. So anyway. We're going to use open source tools. The reason I want to use open source tools is that the closed source tools are incredibly expensive, mind-boggling expensive. Not for students, not for university though. We have every tool from Cadence and Mentor and Synopsis and so on at university. But it's, it's kind of like a heron deal. <laughs> they give you the tools almost for free, but then you can't use the design. So if you design something in Cadence, schematics, layouts at the university, you cannot copy it out from university. Well, if or if you do, if you want to use it in a company, then Cadence wants to have a lot of money. So there's a bunch of restrictions. And also, in order to use, for example, 22 nanometer from global foundries, you have to sign an NDA. You have to sign an NDA. So my thinking is, well, now there's an open source PDK, the Skyweather 130. There's also a GF 180. Uh, don't like that one though. But 
at least the Skywater one, we can do a full design and it can, it's possible to do a tape out. So why not use the open source tools? Because then you own the design. You can then do whatever you want with it. So let's, for example, imagine that you make the best temperature sensor ever in this project. Uh, maybe it's not the best ever on the project, but maybe you improve it on uh, the um, masters. And then you want to make a company on it. And that's fine because you own it. Not me, <laughs> not Dentenu, you. On the masters, you own the design. And nobody, not Cadence, not Synopsis, not anybody, can come and claim money for a design that you made. So that's why I like open source tools. Also, it, ca it kind of uh, fuels me a bit um, because since we pay, as in we as in Nordic, we pay a big number. I can't say the number. We pay a big number to the Cadence, Cadence Synopsis Mentor. It's a very big number. I'd love to be able to pay less. I'd love to be able to make the open source tools good enough so that we don't have to pay and we can bring the cost of the professional tools down. I think it's always going to be the case that the professional tools are not necessarily better, um, but better for... Well, not necessarily always better, but better or necessary to do the most advanced technologies because open source tools simply doesn't have the capac um, the capital investment necessary or the ma manpower necessary to support like two nanometer, three nanometer type of designs. So the professional tools are already, always going to lead, I think, but they are going to be disrupted by the open source tools. So because why pay for something that you can gain for free? and you can actually improve yourself. So that's why we use open source tools. <laughs> but, and this statement applies to any tool, professional or open source. If you haven't used electronic design automation tools before, just lower your expectations. Really lower them. Um, it's not VS Code. Okay. That's what I wanted to uh, touch on today. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in the lecture and uh, hopefully you'll have some fun. Hopefully I'll have some fun and we'll get to May, June and we'll look back on the experience, maybe June after the exam and we'll look back on the experience and we'll say, okay, this was a lot of work, but I learned something and yeah, let's see. Bye-bye.